Fine from Cloud As Hopefully you can all hear us. Uh, we have had some technical difficulties, and Dan, who was a Judah host uh, from Two Degrees, unfortunately they can't get in from their side. So apologies for the little delay, and apologies for the little reformatting of uh, what we're here to do today. But I'd like to introduce you all to um, uh, James Whitham from Two E Travel. Um, the format of the session, just so you know, uh, it's a little bit like question time in that we have some 10 prepared questions um, for James. Um, so we'll go through those one after each other. Um, but please do start to log your questions uh, in. There's a little drop down uh, box at the bottom of your WebEx screen, hopefully. And if you can send them through to um, Tim Knight, uh, and then we'll capture those and add those at the end. So it's not as interactive as question time. I can't see anybody out there in a green shirt, but I will capture your uh, we'll capture your, your questions and we'll add those to the back end of the presentation. Okay, just a little bit about CloudAS before we go into those questions for James. Um, CloudAS has now been going for about um, five years. Uh, we're built on the salesforce.com platform, which enables us to use all of their rich uh, application layer development um, blocks to uh, get to where we needed to be with our application. Um, we've now got some 250 plus customers using our software. Um, people like ERM, even two years ago, said, because they, they're a sustainability consultancy, uh, and when they were looking for their in-house solution themselves, they said even back then that we'd leapfrog the competition. We do that because, as I say, we, we're, we're building on, on the application layer from salesforce.com. Um, Again, we've won some pretty prestigious awards. Back in 2013, Gartner, who look at every different technology sector out there, uh, went, their focus on sustainability nominated as one of six uh, cool vendors uh, in 2013, and we were the only one in this category. So we're going to find out a little bit more about um, TUI, uh, and uh, I'll ask a few questions to James. So James, uh, thanks for joining us today, and also thanks for uh, physically um, bringing us all together into, your, into Cruz's offices here in London. And uh, I was quite amazed to hear that you have some 220 brands across the whole group, and we'll hear a little bit more about that. But yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself and about TUI in general. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Ian, um, and thank you for inviting me to participate in your, your webinar this afternoon. So um, I've had the role of uh, the Group Environmental Manager for TUI Travel for a number of years. Um, so those of you who don't know, TUI Travel is a, a, a large FTSE 100 listed company, and we have many, many brands, of which I'll, I'll show you about in a moment. Um, so uh, created 2007, and uh, we have a large, um, large business all around the world, um, International Holiday Group. You can see the, the details on the screen here, you know, large revenues. Um, we're fairly... The type of business that we have um, in travel and tourism is a fairly low margin business, so it does help to really focus the mind on, on being efficient. So I've had this role since 2007, and prior to the merger, I worked for First Choice Holidays in a, in a similar role. But you know, we were a much smaller company then, FTSE 250 rather than FTSE 100, around 14,000 colleagues. Um, now we've got um, 55,000, so uh, you know, a much, a much bigger um, sort of type of organisation. So we take customers from, you know, source markets or, or, or sort of where we sell our, our products from all over the world, uh, you know, 30 million customers a year. Uh, we've got lots of aircraft. We've got lots of retail shops. Um, you know, everything about us is big. You know, we, we talked about as being, you know, Europe's largest tour operator and one of the largest tour operators in the world. So it's a big organization, big organization um, and therefore it's a big challenge. But to help put that, some of that into to context, um, I've just got a few bullet points here to share with you with regard to um, the industry and the, about TUI Travel as well. So travel and tourism is cited as being the world's largest industry, uh, employing around about 10% of the global workforce, so in excess of 260 million people. But also, the tourism industry is a real force of good when it comes to, to wealth creation. Um, so around 9% of uh, GDP, um, so uh, you know a significant amount um, of money uh, and development is uh, created by, by our industry. But at the same time, there comes a responsibility to try and address those uh, carbon emissions. As you can see there on the screen, it's around about 5% of um, global CO2 emissions. So quite a, 
quite a big number. Um, I mean, in terms of the size of us, uh, we reached a milestone in December 2012. In terms of as an industry, uh, we sort of notched over the 1 billion international tourism arrivals uh, at that point in time. And the annual growth of our industry uh, doesn't seem to show any real signs of letting up just yet. Typically between 4 and 5% growth per year. So, I mean, even in times of recession, people do really seem reluctant to give up their holiday. You know, that's the, that's the one, uh, inverted commas, uh, luxury that they... Exactly, exactly. That, that, that precious time of the family, they're un wanting or un un really don't want to give it up. And um, for us as a business, we've, we've got this sort of uh, uh, strap line or, or mantra about wanting to make our experiences special. Um, we want to ensure that we provide holidays that do cause minimum environmental impact, certainly respect the culture and destinations um, in which we operate and the people who are living there, but also really ensure that we try and offer an economic benefit to those local communities. But certainly with the size of our business, there comes a responsibility uh, as, a, as a large organisation. So hopefully um, that provides some sort of overview um, for um, people who are listening to the webinar. I mean, I'll just make one last remark in terms of a real sustainability challenge that is going to be emerging for us is that whole nexus between climate, water and food. You know, we feed a lot of people on, yeah. on board our cruise ships or in our hotels. And, you know, with climate change taking, a, a, you know, starting to really bite a little bit more, that's going to put pressure on water resources and, and on food as well for us. So it'd be interesting to see how that develops and, and how we really do tackle that challenge. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've got, as I say, 220 disparate companies all in the travel trade, but all with all of those challenges. It's a, it's a massive act to bring all that together. Just, to, just some housekeeping. I think, as people can see, hopefully in the panel, uh, on Webex, we, uh, Dan, uh, although we, we don't have uh, voice from Dan, he, he is sort of um, encouraging people to ask questions uh, within the Q&A box. So if people could start to uh, ask those questions, we're capturing them and we'll uh, ask them of James at the end. But in terms of um, uh, TUI Travel, you have this concept of a sustainability holidays plan. Could you maybe tell us a little bit more about that? And I think there were some 20 commitments um, that, that drive that plan. Yeah, no, absolutely. Ian. Yeah, we've got um, we've got a sustainable holidays plan, which is a three-year plan uh, comprising four key areas that we devised uh, around two two to three years ago, and we've got these twenty commitments across these different uh, sort of impact areas. Um, the four key areas, as you can see on the screen now, are all about addressing impact in destinations to do with our carbon emissions, um, and also trying to build engagement and um, create capacity for our colleagues to help us on this journey and also trying to respond to and stimulate demand from customers when it comes to sustainability. Carbon really is the area that I tend to focus on the most. That's the one that you can just see that red um, sort of square around. Yep. And we've got some really quite large sources of carbon as well. Within the 20 commitments, there are seven alone that just sort of pertain to, to carbon and carbon management. And as you can see from the next slide, you know, the five key sources of emissions for us in carbon are to do with our airlines, to do with our cruise ships, um, operating our, our retail shops and our major office premises, um, our hotels as well, um, and also how you get our guests from A to B when they arrive, you know, the coach, coach as well. I would guess um, Air is, is the largest producer of carbon. Absolutely, yeah, right? absolutely. So if you look in our sustainability report, if you look in our annual report, you can see a nice little uh, um, sort of pie chart in terms of the uh, emissions and you're right you know airlines is around 85 to 90 percent of our total footprint right. so you know that's where you know we understand we do spend quite a lot of time and effort on, on reducing those emissions and it has been very successful as a result yeah so yeah as you can just see here in front of you that's the, that's the key headline goal for us with regard to carbon that's about operating Europe's most fuel efficient airlines and from the research that we've done uh, and the disclosure that uh, we've made and, and what our sort of uh, peers have made as well that uh, at present, you know, we are, you know, it would appear to be one of the most, if not the most efficient airline organization within Europe and beyond in terms of uh, emissions per passenger kilometer. Typically, we are around 20% more carbon efficient than the leading um, budget carriers right. and around one third more efficient than the leading schedule carriers as well. So, you know, that real focus on efficiency uh, has, you know, and is paying off. Is this is that data sort of, do you, do you uh, obviously, you, you have a, uh, your own sustainability report you put up, but, but is that readily available in terms of your, the, uh, the people who are also in your market in terms of 
doing that comparison? Is that readily available? Today? To to an extent, yeah, to an extent. I mean, we we sort of created a call to action some some months ago, really, to try and stimulate interest and transparency uh, among um, aviation, the aviation world, about you know let's create a, uh, a you know an easily understandable format for for carbon efficiency from our airlines, yeah. for um, you know for holidays for, for aviation. Uh, and that's something that, uh, you know, we are certainly sort of walking the talk there. You know, we had all our numbers poured over by a, a big four company, PwC, and, and they produced, um, you know, some commentary in our in our most recent annual reporting accounts that was published at the end of last year. So, you know, we we certainly want to be a thought leader um, and uh, we want to do the doing as well, you know, that yeah. we need to take the action. So, you know, we're, we're very happy about taking responsibility for, um, for, for being transparent. No, that's impressive. Okay, so what were the main drivers for this sustainability holidays plan? Uh, and what, going into it, uh, obviously you were measuring lots of things uh, already, but going into it, what were the hard benefits that you expected to see? Okay, so I think for us it makes absolute business sense um, from, uh, from an environmental perspective as well that we really do need to get on top of carbon management as, a, as an issue and to really make it business as usual, you know, not, just a, not just a bolt on. Uh, you know, we spend a significant amount of money on aviation fuel, as you highlighted already. Yep. It is, you know, the largest area of our carbon emissions. So whilst the Sustainable Holidays Plan is not all about aviation and all about carbon, certainly it, it is a, a big part of it. Um, I mean, part of the driver and part of the reason to want to try and bring our strategy together in a coherent way is, you know, if you only have to look at the cost of uh, Brent, Brent crude oil you know, mm-hmm. um, in recent times, you know, you go back to 1998, the cost of a, of a barrel was $13, right. and it's now around $110. So, you know, that's a seven to eight fold increase. So that really does obviously focus the mind. But also, as I said, you know, we want to use the Sustainable Holidays Plan as a, as a, a mechanism to really win hearts and minds uh, within our own organization. There's some interesting statistics out there about uh, an organization that has a good embedded culture of sustainability is a more productive organization, has perhaps less absenteeism, and just generally people are more motivated. So we certainly wanted to use it as a, uh, as a real um, springboard for that engagement. Um, I guess also is just to try and bring together those very different parts of our business onto the same page when it came to sustainability. Yeah, we work from many different source markets, different countries. Those countries themselves are in different places on the sustainability journey. So we wanted to try and use uh, our, our sustainable holidays plan as a way of bringing that together. I mean, in terms of some of the hard benefits, uh, I can't talk about too many of the, the financial numbers today only because my colleague in our sustainability team uh, would, uh, I'd be in trouble with her because we're about to launch our next sustainability report early next week. Okay. Um, but certainly, you know, we have, we have derived some financial benefits. Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have that credibility without, or amongst our senior colleagues, uh, particularly the board, if there weren't some out-and-out financial benefits. But certainly, you know, I wanted to reiterate that you know, because of our side, there is that responsibility, and you know we have to ensure that we do you know really deliver yeah. uh, when it comes to the sustainability activities of a large company such as our own. And in terms of the plan, obviously you're asking a lot of a lot of people, or I mean, you're gathering a lot of data from lots of, as I, as I mentioned, two hundred and twenty black brands. And as you say, that brings a lot of the companies together, which gives them a focus, a focus around a positive thing. But uh, who were the executive sponsors that, that sort of uh, back this plan? Okay. So the way that we sort of govern sustainable development at TUI Travel is, is principally twofold. Uh, much like many organizations, we have two boards. We have a sort of uh, an external looking or external facing board, our PLC board, right. which is a mixture of executives and non-exec directors. Um, and we're fortunate enough to have our deputy CEO, Johan Lundgren, who is the, uh, the main board sponsor at that level. Uh, and then the board that sort of uh, sits below that one is called our group management board, um, primarily made up of executives from within the company. And that is uh, a lady called Jackie Simmons, who's our group HR director. So having made that remark earlier about sort of the linkage between in employee culture and about uh, building uh, interactivity with people and, and generally a, a good sustainability culture, there's a, there's a really good fit there. Um, and Johan is a, you know, is a great supporter of the work that we do and is increasingly being Support, supporting us by talking publicly at some very high-profile events about sustainable development and why it's a critical business issue for travel and tourism in particular. Yes. So anybody who's listening who works in travel and tourism may have heard him sit uh, on the uh, the stage or, or sit and speak on the stage, interviewed by Stephen Sacker, among other senior panelists 
at the World Travel Market last year. So, you know, having people talk passionately and publicly about this at a very senior level really does help to provide a, a, a great platform to, um, you know, to, to talk with people both internally and externally. Yeah, and it must be good for you as well. You put a lot of effort in, I know, to, to get to where you are. We'll see some of the output later. But to know that it is, you know, at the highest level in the company, it's, it's, uh, it's appreciated and being talked about. So that's great. Absolutely. Uh, and, and how are you actually progressing against these targets? Well, as I, as I just mentioned before, we, we're about to publish the, uh, the latest results and progress against our, what will be year two of our sustainable holidays plan okay. at the start of next week. Um, so that will be against the financial year 13. But in general, we are making some good progress about the, uh, with regard to the 20 commitments rather. Uh, we've published some up-to-date information with our last annual report and accounts. But, you know, it would certainly be fair to say that some of these commitments are quite stretching. Yes. Uh, I mean, one, one of those in particular would be about our goal to do with destinations, whereby we talked about wanting to deliver what we call 10 million greener and fairer holidays. Uh, and by that, we talked about measuring customers who are staying in hotels that have real credible sustainability certification. Um, you know, without giving too much away that we're going to be publishing at the beginning of next week, certainly we're on the right track, but it is a, it is a big R. Yeah. Uh, you know, we take 30 million guests away each year. So we were talking about 10 million guests staying in greener or fairer hotels over three years. But I guess if, you know, our business, whilst we have, you know, we could offer every single, you know, holiday experience you can imagine, you know, the majority still of our customers are going on holiday in the mainstream part of our business. You okay. know, the, the typical sort of, you know, Mediterranean uh, style sort of beach type holiday. So if you can really affect change in the mainstream, you can take inverted commas, you know, you can take a lot of people with you yeah. uh, on that journey towards uh, a more sustainable holiday. So, I mean, that certainly is a, an area for us to, to focus on. Certainly making good progress in, in a lot of the other commitments. Uh, you know, I'd say watch this space, you know, look out for the sustainability report going to be published at the start of next week. Uh, and, you know, it's, we realize that we're on, the, we're on a journey. We're, you know, we're, we're beyond the start, but we certainly haven't got there yet. And, uh, you know, we will keep challenging ourselves for, for the benefit of ourselves, of uh, our other stakeholders, both in uh, our source markets and in destinations in particular, um, because this is, you know, is in, you know really important for the, the long-term viability of, of the travel, travel industry, taking a real sustainable approach. Yeah, I think you said um, in background to the, to the call that there's some 55,000 uh, employees with it across the TUI group. Mm. I think only five of you in sustainability. So, well, five in the... Well, four in the, uh, in the in the central team, yeah. and around about fifty um, full-time equivalent across the across the business. So part of our role is about creating capacity um, and creating um, you know the platform for people to really start to incorporate this into their into their day-to-day -day roles. I mean, that's a big enough challenge in itself. But what other challenges specifically did you come along in, in this journey to get to where you are now? Okay, well, you know, I've already highlighted the fact that we're a FTSE 100 company, uh, and you know, for that reason. There are, um, you know, there are some challenges of uh, being a lot, being a large organisation. Um, you know, we have to disclose in both a voluntary and a, and a mandatory capacity, and I'll, I'll tell you about that in, in just a moment. Um, but you know, working in multiple time zones with colleagues who speak many other languages. I mean, English is often still the, the main language that we, we kind of uh, correspond in. Right. But um, dealing with different cultures who've got different approaches and uh, different understandings about sustainable development, should we say, mm -hmm. that does create its challenges. It certainly makes it interesting. Um, getting everybody on the same part, page regarding you know, that level of ambition is, is also um, a challenge. But, uh, you know, it's, it's what keeps it interesting, Ian, yeah. Yeah, should I say, yeah. um, for sure. I think the communication bit was quite interesting. I, I, I know I've seen a number of uh, uh, video clips that you use for internal training, where, whereby if people couldn't come to a webinar and hear about it, they, they could go, I guess, to your intranet and, and click on a link and hear, hear about what your, your plans were. I think that communication aspect is something I've seen sort of looking in, if you like, but that uh, you put a lot of effort into. Yeah. So what was the motivation for, uh, for selecting a, uh, a sustainability performance management solution? You said um, prior to this, you were doing this, um, collecting the data. This is your second report that's just gone out. Um, what was the motivation to say, okay, enough's enough, we're going to need to do something different? Okay. Almost about a year ago, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So if we, if we just go to the next slide, and I can just sort of show you a nice little highlight here about what some of the, uh, you know, challenges um, were upon us. So at the present time, we have both a mixture of 
uh, regulatory uh, and voluntary disclosure requirements. So in a, in a voluntary capacity, those highlighted in green there, we've got things like the Carbon Disclosure Project, something that we've responded to for many years. Yeah. Um, we've been a, a member or included within the FTSE for Good Index for, for many years as well. And we obviously produce, uh, as we're about to again, a sustainability report. All of that requires data, um, requires quantitative information as well as qualitative, but, but quantitative is the area that I focus on primarily. Right. Um, I mean, that's just a voluntary picture. And then you've got obviously the mandatory picture. Uh, you know, as, a, as an organization listed in the UK, you have to produce an annual corn account of anyway. Uh, and obviously the landscape changed somewhat last year, uh, first of October last year, with the introduction of mandatory carbon reporting. Uh, and we were one of the, the guinea pig companies, as it were, we were captured um, one of the first batch of companies. There's around about 1,000 companies who are obliged to, to participate in the mandatory carbon reporting. And we're a batch of about 60 to 80 caught because of the way that our financial year um, sits. Okay. Um, and also you've got carbon reduction commitment. And then also because even though we're listed in the UK, we've got parts of our business because of their size in, in the different source markets. Uh, France, for example, also has a requirement to, to disclose. So you know, one of, the, one of the key drivers is about trying to just make that process more seamless less time consuming, uh, et cetera. Um, so I mean, that, that, that's, I guess, some of, the, some of the background. And also, you know, we've been using uh, Microsoft Excel for many, many years, as you know, lots, of companies, have, yeah, as lots of companies have and, and continue to do so. It's a fantastic tool. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of its capabilities, we were getting to the point where actually, you know, the reporting landscape was changing and we felt that we needed something that just gave us an edge uh, in terms of turning data around and really starting to uh, to make more use of it. In fact, if we if we go to the the next slide, what I can do is just illustrate it very 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 quickly. Um, okay, so what you can see on the screen now is a, a screenshot of sort of the quality and the level of the disclosure that we did back in 2005, the time when we did our first sustainability report. And then now, what you're about to see is a bubble page spread from our annual reporting accounts, uh, the carbon pages. We had eight pages. Uh, in the 2013 annual report, <coughs> and you know you can see, uh, albeit it's perhaps quite small <laughs> on the on the screen there, but you can see some tables and you can see some narrative about that. You know that that's how things have evolved, and that's obviously sort of less than less than 10 years. In terms of the the um, the transparency that's required, with the real focus from different stakeholders, etc. So you've got a lot of uh, you know you've got a lot of you've got a big shift that you have to to keep up with. Um, so the motivation really was about making better use of the time, the relatively limited time and resources we have at our central sustainability department. And, um, you know, moving beyond just the reporting and actually doing some real interesting stuff with the data that we were getting. Yeah, I think we, we talked to a lot of people at that inflection point where, as you say, enough's enough with spreadsheets. And, and the, the common uh, comments are along the lines. That most people who get into sustainability, they're very passionate about sustainability. They want to make a change. What they don't want to do is be spending 60% of their time filling in data, checking data, mashing data, hoping they've got the data right. They want to do more creative things on behalf of the business. So uh, I think most organizations do get to that point. Uh, yeah, absolutely. As you indeed did. So if you, could, if you could take us through a little bit about the selection process you went through. I think as, a, as uh, we were talking earlier, it, it kind of finished around about a year ago, but and, and our vision of it, if you like, from the outside through that process, was it was it, it seemed very structured. Uh, it was very clear. At any given time, we knew where we were. We knew what was happening next. But I'm sure there was a lot more going on behind that or before that. No, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, to, to sort of coin a phrase, as it were, uh, from a familiar uh, advert you may have seen on television, we uh, we compared the market. Uh, <laughs> you know, there, there are a lot of providers out there now. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly crowded market compared to 12, 18, 24 months ago. So what we first of all started doing is actually just seeing, you know, who was out there and what, what on the face of it could they offer, looking at, you know, possible supplier sites, looking at their own demos, either online demos or, you know, being talked through demos, et cetera. Um, one of the resources that we made certainly good use of is the, a paper that has been uh, published by an organization called um, Carbon Clear. And, uh, you know, this was quite a, quite a useful document, what they called like a white paper on, you know, how do you go about choosing some carbon uh, accounting software. Yep. Um, so we made use of that. We spoke to sustainability colleagues, you know, I, you know, I know quite a lot of people in the sustainability world from my own sector, but also certainly outside of travel and tourism, from meeting 
at events and conferences, and I sort of sounded them out really about, you know, do you have any overly positive or, or perhaps negative experiences of, of uh, vendors that you've worked with and systems that you've then subsequently implemented? Um, and then what we did was obviously then start to put together some requirements about what it was that we wanted, what were we going to use this for? Um, so we wanted to be really clear when we when we spoke to um, when we spoke to the prospective vendors, we didn't want to just say, oh, I think we need a sustainability performance management system. End of conversation. You know, we wanted to be specific about, you know, what were we going to use it for? What was the time scale about our implementation program? Um, you know, what kind of data were we going to use it for? So we received a number of demo sessions from prospective suppliers. Um, as I said, we kind of like then used that also to help sort of uh, finalize our brief. Uh, we worked with colleagues in Group IT because even though we were um, and this was, you know, language I was not familiar with at the time. We ended up procuring essentially something called software as a service. I didn't know whether or not we had to be hosting stuff. So, you know, spoke to colleagues in IT, spoke to colleagues in procurement as well, because this was quite a significant level of expenditure that we were making. So we wanted to be sure that, you know, colleagues in procurement were giving us advice on, you know, tender and, and tendering. Um, and also that, uh, you know, from the IT point of view, you know, what were, what were going to be then the summing blocks? What were going to be some of the key questions that we should ask um, prospective vendors as well? So we produced a tender. We put it out there. We invited uh, a number of people to participate. But also, um, again, this was, uh, this was provided, uh, this tip was provided to me from a colleague within the travel industry who had already been through the process um, about this sort of uh, relatively small but, um, but really um, helpful um, IT slash sustainability um, consultancy based in Bristol called Sustain It, who um, had certainly helped them uh, very positively. Um, and what we did by talking to Sustain It was to get some real specific advice and guidance about, you know, when we get to that shortlisting process, what you know, what are the what are the questions that really cut the ice? You know, what would really cuts the chase? What would we, um, you know, what would put them on the spot to help them, you know, provide a, you know, there may be a really good presentation, but what are those key questions that we need to ask? So they actually, um, we got the Spaniards to come along as well to when we did the supplier selection sort of shortlisting and also final presentations. Uh, and we had, you know, colleagues around the table from our sustainability business or, or colleagues from the sustainability world within two travel around the table. And we had, you know, somebody from Sustainit as well. Um, and they helped us to really sort of provide some um, expertise that we didn't necessarily have to make us feel a lot more comfortable uh, about the uh, process. So, you know, we, we got the vendors in, we did the selection process, and, uh, you know, obviously the, the result was um, partnering with Cloud Apps. Um, and as, as we said, you know, around about a year ago now, we um, sort of made that decision and then started the process of implementation. Yeah, I remember the last, uh, as you say, we came in for, I guess, everybody came in for the same presentation down in Gatwick, and uh, um, I think that possibly was the first time we'd met, actually. Certainly with a large team there. Um, Nick, you mentioned, um, Joe from Sustain It, but also your colleagues from uh, around Europe. Yeah. Um, it, I think it was a very interactive session. I think you 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 allowed all of your colleagues to have uh, their input. But what I also quite liked um, was at the very end, you sort of asked me how I got, got to you. I'd taken the train down to Gatwick, and uh, you said, well, don't worry about getting a bus back. I've got a special... Uh, a free pass, basically, to get you well, back. Well, exactly. I mean, so you, you certainly... Uh, you live in the, live in the sustainability dream. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so that, and I did take the bus from the airport initially and then back with a free pass. Anyway. Um, um, so, yes, you went through that process. Um, you went through the shortlisting process. Could you tell us why you actually chose us in the end, please? Absolutely. Um, I mean, there are a number, there are a number of reasons. Um, you know, which I, I'll, I will elaborate on for, for the benefit of, of those listening uh, and obviously looking at the screen screens on that we're looking at. Um, you know, the fact that you were able to offer a dedicated project manager throughout the implementation process, the fact that you weren't put off by our rather aggressive time, um, time scale for, for implementing the process. You know, our financial year is the 1st of October to the 30th of September. So we were doing all that legwork in the sort of spring, early summer, made, made final selection around June, and then we had our kickoff, you know, in July last year. So we literally had about three months to do all the implementation and get it off the ground in time to do the data collection at the end of our financial year, at the end of September last year, in time to get the right quality of data 
um, all aggregated, summarized, sliced and diced in all the different ways we needed to, to report in our annual reporting account at the end of last calendar year to meet the needs of mandatory carbon reporting. So, you know, you, you weren't put off by the, uh, the time scale that we had, which was reassuring. As I said, they had a dedicated project manager, but also one of the things that we picked up on from one of your other clients, again, somebody I'd spoken to in the sort of sustainability fraternity, mm -hmm. was about the fact that you could provide somebody on site on a regular basis, perhaps once a week, yeah. and help us really basically handhold us to make sure that, you know, we were doing what was required of us, because it was very much a partnership approach. It wasn't just a case of, right, cloud apps, here you go, guys, you know, get amongst all of our different data requirements and, you know, and, you know, deliver us the finished product. I mean, we have to understand and we would get the most out of the system if we worked in partnership with you. And that's what, as I said, my colleague Nick in our sustainable development team did. Um, so your colleague Michelle, who came to see us once a week, literally kind of they sat down each week, for the day, worked all the tasks, and then, you know, Nick was given homework for the week prior to <laughs> Michelle returning the following week. So, you know, there really was a, it really was a, a, a useful um, if not essential exercise and, and way of working with you. I mean, one of the other USPs, I guess, about about cloud apps having seen a number of other systems was the, well, to use IT speak, the UX or user experience in terms of the look, the cleanliness. I mean, we've got um, we've got some just to show you here. Um, got a couple of slides actually. Um, so you know, here's one of the forms that would have gone out to our um, suppliers. So you know, we could customize the look and feel to make it look like it was entirely to travel. Um, you know, the, the fact that uh, when we said, well, you know, at the moment we're just using Excel and we're asking for it in English, really we'd like to get the, to, to, to increase the, the quality of the responses, mm -hmm. we'd like to offer it in five languages plus English. And, you know, you didn't pull off the chair at that point. Um, so then, you know, we're able to work with you to, to ensure that we customize the front end yeah. in, in those five languages plus English. But also, you know, one of the, the key benefits I think has been, and as, as you'll see in a moment, we've got some slides to, to show you, is the kind of the outputs that you can get from the system. Uh, in terms of, you know, one of the key stakeholders or set of stakeholders that we wanted to use this system for um, was um, the hotel change that we've got in the business. Right. right. Um, so, I mean, if we go to the next slide, what I can show you is, so this is just, I guess, like a, like a data, well, you, you probably better explain this, it's like a data tree within within the cloud system. So this is, you know, obviously the kind of the back end. Yeah. And then if we go down to the next slide, what I can show you is, well, we can produce, um, for each of our hotel chains, which we've got around about 20 in, in the group, we, to provide feedback to them, to provide, you know, to make it a two-way street rather than just a one-way street, we want to provide them with data, with feedback, um, and a bespoke report about their performance in the previous financial year. Yeah. So what, what the cloud app system enabled us to do um, sort of using a particular um, piece of software as well, was to produce a hotel sustainability report by, rather than having to manually produce it, you know, Cloud Apps with a, another piece of software called Conquer Composer, produce the, the report, and then just kind of suck in all the data from around and about the, the database, and then just populate the report. And my colleague Nick reckoned that probably the, the time to create these reports would have gone down, um, or would have saved around about 80% of the time, because he would have been previously manually creating each of these reports putting in some narrative, um, and with the cloud app system, you can just populate all of this. But also, I mean, CDP, I mentioned before, it's one of our key sort of planks of disclosure that we've used, yeah. and we'll continue to do so. And, you know, with, with cloud apps, it, obviously you keep up to date with all that's developing in, in the likes of, you know, CDP and DGSI and all this kind of stuff. And, and so, you know, you've got sort of like a, a program that will just sort of like pre-populate the, particularly the quantitative numbers mm -hmm. that are required for, for CDP. So, I mean, any organization that has just perhaps, you know, submitted their uh, CDP, you know, for 2014 will know that it is a, a quite a large undertaking, no matter what size organization you are. But it, it just, you know, it just meant that, as you said before, we could um, we could spend some time on, on the doing, on the reducing, on the building engagement, rather than just purely on the reporting. So, you know, the, uh, the, the combination of some of those aspects really um, meant that it was a, um, you know, a, 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 a clear winner, you know, you know choosing, choosing you um, to, be, to be the partner that we worked with. So, I mean, just really in summary, I mean, some of these I've already mentioned before, so, you know, kind of moving away from Excel, um, automating that data collection process, so, you know, the user who we want to collect data from gets sent an automatic username and password, 
Um, you know, in partnership again with you, we produced a short video to help make it really clear for people. Um, at the moment, we're still reporting annually, but you know, obviously, we want to revisit that with the with the, the powerful nature of of the Cloud Apps database okay. to try and increase that frequency. Um, we've talked about the language capability. Um, certainly, the dashboard is something that you know that whole not so much the user experience at the front end, but yeah. also the user experience at the back end as yeah. well. You know, is uh, is a key bonus. Um, certainly improving data accuracy because there are thresholds that you can set within within the system as well, so you don't get you know silly silly typos or, or silly answers. You know, it, it interrogates the historic data that's in there and says, well, hold on a minute. Last year you said ten, now you're saying ten thousand. Yeah. You know, what, yeah, what to revalidate. Yeah, yeah, and actually, it's, it's also you know when it comes to auditing, you know, the system is is sort of uh, fully auditable. It does mean that the process of auditing is is less painful, is more cost effective for the you know, for the, the disclosure of the reporter such as ourselves. Um, and also last year, even though we were focusing primarily on using it for, for carbon data, we also did use it to report some, for the first time, uh, some non-environmental KPIs as well, uh, associated with um, sort of uh, the gender balance, the gender mix, um, the management structure of our hotels as well. So, you know, it will be, and it is, you know, a central hub for sustainability information. Um, that's, for, that's for sure. Yeah, I think what you've done with it, uh, with it is impressive. In the timescales, as you say, you had up front and what you've subsequently done. And I think, as you rightly say, um, you know, the, the best um, CDP and GRI uh, bodies coming together, uh, also acknowledging the fact that there's, there's, there's questions that are, and answers that are relevant to both, both sets of disclosures. I think that's going to make, make it easier as well. Absolutely. I know you track those organizations as we do, so that's great. Um, I guess final question from the pre-format uh, is um, for the audience out there. As you say, you you did a lot of networking. I think you networked quite a bit up front to to get the, the, the structure of how you wanted to um, look at the, the process of of, uh, of evaluating and selecting a, a solution. But are the are the five tips that you could give to the audience out there if they're about to embark on a similar exercise? Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. So. Um, yeah, I mean these are, I mean these are some of my tips. I mean some of them you may have already uh, picked up on before, but certainly whoever's going to be the project manager for side, you know, in the in, shall we say within the corporate, um, they need to be what I put in brackets there or in vertical commas, a well-connected person. They need to understand your business. Ideally, they they need to have some sort of lines of communi open lines of communication with you know people in corporate comms, within IT, within procurement, because it is not a small undertaking to go out there and cure a system. So, you know, they really need to know what it is they want and also who do they need to speak to, who, who are the gatekeepers within the business. Right. Uh, that, that's certainly one, one point. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, certainly do review the market. Um, you know, there are, there are reports out there and, and guidance being given by the likes of uh, Carbon Clear to help you try and steer your way through the, the many different things on offer. I think KPMG have done a similar report as well in the past. Um, but, you know, we, we found the, the Sustain It um, impartial expertise particularly helpful as both Nick and I, whilst you know, we're, we're sort of focused on sustainable development um, and about reducing emissions, you know, that's one of the key areas that we work on. You know, we're not experts in that because sustainable help, we're able to help us be that intermediary to facilitate conversations between, say, I, I, our IT people and the IT people and uh, others um, at Cloud Apps, um, as it turned out, as, as well as the other, you know, final shortlisted companies as well. Um, as I said, you know, assuming you have the budget, do think about the extras and things like that up front. You know, you know the training materials that you'll require, the time that will be required, um, and certainly languages. You know, lots of companies, you know, are they may be, you know, I, I guess we may be speaking primarily to an audience that are based in the UK, but they've probably got parts of the businesses that are global. Um, and certainly, we found that we got a, a better. People were more receptive to a questionnaire about sustainability if it was being delivered in their home home or their, their native tongue um, and we, we chose those sort of five key languages um, as well because we just wanted to, to make it as easy for them as possible. Um, in terms of, you know, I mentioned about sort of milestones and timescales, I guess you do need to think quite clearly about, you know, what is your financial year? Are you using it to get you sort of fast track towards becoming uh, a better responder to the needs of CDP or mandatory carbon reporting, but certainly do sort of work backwards. I'd say the lead time for us to go from, you know, the proper amount of time that we worked on this was probably, you know, three to six months in terms of the, the selection process. I mean, that by no means every day, not at all, but, you know, in terms of, you know, working out what it was we needed, who we were going to perhaps get it from, 
you know, we, we wrote a tender that had probably 80 to 100 questions in it. Mm -hmm. You know, we had input, as I said, from people in IT, from procurement, sustainability colleagues around the business. So, you know, it's with everything, the more preparation you put into it, the, the quality output, or the higher quality the output you get in terms of, you know, are you asking the right questions mm -hmm. of, the, of the right people? Um, but also, yeah, certainly talk to your peers. You know, there are a lot of networks out there now, such as Two Degrees, obviously, among others. You know, talk to your talk to your opposite numbers within your sector, within your trade association, or at events and conferences. And just, you know, if you hear somebody speak about the fact that they've come up with a and implemented a, a system like this, then, you know, talk to them and, and just say, look, I'm thinking about doing the same. What guidance or, you know, what are the pitfalls you should avoid? And certainly make reference to the, the Carbon Clear white paper as well. Um, we on an earlier slide we did include the um, the web link so when when the, the presentation is available in due course you'll be able to click on that link and it will take you directly to it it's only a relatively short paper but it just it just provides some uh, just provides some 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 key thoughts that you should have if you're going out there to procure great James thank you very much indeed I think that was a hopefully a great that was an excellent summary of uh, the process you went through uh, the issues out there in the marketplace uh, and and the journey, uh, uh, the impressive journey that you've covered in the, in, the, in a very short uh, space of time for a, such a large organisation. And we've had quite, we've still got about uh, 10 to 15 minutes left. Um, we've had some great questions coming in uh, from everybody out there, so thank you for that. Keep them coming in if there's any other questions out there. And I will just, we won't have time for them all, unfortunately. We'll just ha be able to sort of maybe ask a few of them. One of them was actually related to, as you were saying, the different languages and, and uh, uh, how you interacted with the, your, your various colleagues globally. A question here says, how did you deal with dif the different attitudes in different countries towards sustainability? So not just looking, I guess, at the language aspect of it, but do people in different territories, if you like, have different attitudes uh, to sustainability as a whole? Um, absolutely. I mean, we've got within, as I said, we've got 31 source markets, We've got 10 key source markets which are across Europe. So all the kind of usual suspects that you would think, you know, France, Belgium, Germany, Holland, the Nordics, uh, UK, obviously. Um, certainly people within those countries are on different, on the different places on the page when it comes to sustainable development. But we, we, have, uh, we have very open lines of communication with sustainability colleagues across the business. We meet on a, on a semi-annual basis. We get together basically for a conference for a couple of days. And we work very collaboratively. We all, we're all passionate about making travel and tourism more sustainable yep. um, and about reducing emissions, about creating greater benefits for destinations, etc. Um, I mean, ultimately, it's the role of the sustainable development team in the UK to coordinate that activity, but it is very much a team effort. It's a joint effort. Um, we're very honest, open, transparent, uh, and, and very good at listening to the, the, the individual needs of our, of our colleagues around the business and want to support them adequately. In the main, as I said, we're all on the same page, but I guess some of us in our source markets are in different places on that journey. Yeah. Uh, and we have to be mindful of that. And we have to be respectful of that. Uh, one size is not going to fit all, so it is a challenge, but, yeah. it's, but it's, a, it's an interesting one. I think with the quality, and I have seen an electronic version of the, the, do, the document, as you say, you're publishing next Tuesday. I think you know when, you're, when all that part of your group see the quality of that and they're part of it, I think, that, as you say, Arthur, it's going to bring people very, very close to, yeah. uh, to, the, to, the, um, to, to the desire that you have as a, as a central team. Yeah. Um, so here's another question um, related both to um, your competitors and, and your customers. Do you think your customers care as much about sustainability as you do? And what do you think can be done to improve the communication and standardization of information in the sector? Because some of your competitors for very little information. Yeah, I mean, it, that's, a, that's a good question. If I, could use a, if I could use an analogy with regard to, say, customer demand, um, you know, there's probably a number of people who are participating in this webinar and certainly in this room right now who have got devices that are made by a certain company based in California whose logo resembles a piece of fruit, <laughs> um, should we say. And, you know, I'm guessing that you individually didn't, you know, approach that particular company and say, oh, you know what? I'd really like a device that can help me make calls. I can do video calls on it. I can, you know, organize my life, et cetera. Yeah. You know, they didn't wait for that demand. They created and stimulated that demand. Uh, and to an extent, we're trying to do the same thing. We're trying to stimulate that demand, and we're trying to offer you know, 
holidays that have a real sustainability element to them. Uh, and you know, when it comes to customers, certainly from the research that we've done, there is some really good um, feedback that we've got from them from talking to some specific um, sort of target groups within within source markets um, around Europe and beyond. And that um, you know, customers have said to us that you know they don't necessarily they don't necessarily want no rather I'll put this the other way they would want the holiday operator, the tour operator, to take that responsibility. They kind of almost expect that um, of you um, to an extent. They, they want you to, to lead. Um, they want you to take responsibility. They want you to make it easy. They don't want necessarily to be dictated to. At the end of the day, if, you know, like we mentioned before, you're going on holiday, you want to have a good time. You don't necessarily want to be worrying too much about um, you know, the particular impact you might be having because you want to ensure that the, perhaps the tour operator is actually taking care of that for you. Yes. Um, so, you know, we, you know we, we, we want to certainly respond to that demand and then where we can, we want to, we want to stimulate it. And I'm just, um, I'm just looking for some, a couple of figures here to, to try and illustrate that. Um, I and mean, we've got, you know, we've got statistics that say that, you know, lots of customers will be interested if a more sustainable holiday were available, if it was at the right price. Now, obviously, you know, customers, if they're presented with two options, um, you know, in the, in the financial times that we live in, it's not always an easy choice. Mm -hmm. You know, do you, do you go for the one that is perhaps more sustainable? Um, you know, so for that reason, you know, we have to try and make sure that we sort of mainstream sustainable development within our holidays and that actually, you know, it just becomes part of the way that we, that we do business. And, you know, we're not necessarily going to brand it as a sustainable holiday. It's just, uh, you go on holiday with us and we will have, you know, taken care of the, you know, sustainability elements. Um, that's sort of just, a, you know, that's sort of what we're, um, you know, what we're aiming for yeah. uh, in, the, in the future. Um, I mean, it, just to sort of highlight, you know, what I was talking about. So some recent research we have um, commissioned, um, you know, one in two, 50% of our consumers said they'd be more willing to book a sustainable holiday if it were available. So right. obviously that's a, a good signal. Yeah. Uh, two thirds of the, say, of the consumers say, as I mentioned before, they want the holiday company to take that responsibility. Yeah. Um, to make it more sustainable for them. And two thirds as well said um, that they would change their behavior on holiday if they thought it would help the environment. So there is certainly that customer interest and demand, but we, you know, we can't necessarily sit back and just wait for that to, to continue. We have to stimulate that demand and we have to create more sustainable holidays on an ongoing basis. Yeah, I think as you say, you know, you've got lots of hotels, lots of hotel chains, you've got cruise ships and what have you. And if people see uh, an attitude from your colleagues who work there, and who's support them on their holidays that you know, they're not wasting things and uh, whether it's water or food or whatever it is you get the, it will give the impression actually without it being blatant up front at the choice of a holiday that actually it, it is a, uh, a sustainable experience if you like I think, I think there's something natural about humans they don't they hate waste you know we yeah. hate throwing food away that we haven't used from the fridge so if they see that that is controlled in a nice way within your environments that, that people go on holidays to, yeah. that, that gives a very good impression as well. Yeah. So I hope that answered the question. It does indeed. Thank you. Um, a question going further out here, uh, basically asking, in tw with 2015 not, not that far away, what happens in 2020? I'm guessing this question is relating to our sustainable holidays plan and what we think of the future. Yes. Will the four girls remain or do you think others will be added? That's a good question and I don't wish to preempt what, what the future pathway and duration of our sustainable holidays plan might look like. Um, I mean, the, the three-year holiday plan was sort of, as it were, what the, what the board and what the business felt comfortable with at the time in terms of that time horizon. I mean, the travel and tourism industry is a very resilient one and very used to dealing with many, many um, factors and issues outside of our control in many cases that are thrown at us, you know, whether it be SARS, bird flu, you know, um, volcanic ash, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, uh, as I said, sustainable holiday plan at the moment is three years, comes to an end in uh, September this year, which is why we tend to say, you know, by, by 2015, we would have achieved our kind of goals or we're aiming to achieve these goals. So um, the, the honest answer to that question is I'm not sure um, whether or not we will rejig the carbon colleagues, customers and destinations and whether or not we will go out in terms of um, further into the future uh, or what that, what that uh, duration might be. So watch this space. Okay, we will. Uh, another question, what are the main data challenges you have come across in measuring and accounting for TUI's climate change impact? Okay, so well, one of the challenges is the fact that we do have these 220 brands and we have to make sure that 
we are capturing uh, what we feel are the material emissions from around our business. Now, obviously, you've got the obvious ones like airlines. You know, the airlines are responsible for around 85, 90% of our footprint. And fortunately, you know, we have six airlines. They account for things. They account for fuel burn very accurately because you know, it's a big expenditure, and so we're going to do that naturally. We've got you know some cruise businesses, etc. It's um, it's a case sometimes of just sort of keeping up to date with all of the different um, evolutions of reporting. So. You know, we haven't particularly talked about scope three reporting today, you know, looking at your sort of indirect emissions when it comes to um, supply chain. But that, that's one of the challenges for us um, now and in the future is really getting to grips with, with scope three, getting to grips with those indirect emissions. Um, so, you know, I guess the challenge is about ensuring that we report, you know, obviously mandatory carbon reporting required you to do um, not only CO2, but CO2E, CO2 carbon equivalent. Yeah. Um, so ensuring that you know you've got the right factors, um, and just really keeping pace with the way that uh, um, that disclosing organisations, uh, or rather um, companies who wish you to disclose, like CEP, uh, yeah. etc. Um, just keeping keeping pace really with the demands placed upon these large organisations, um, from to be a, to, to be to continue to be transparent, um, and to um, to report you know effectively on your on your operations. Um, and you know, working across all these different borders, different languages, different time zones, you know, th those those are some it's of the pretty impressive. Well, impressive. those are some of the challenges, and that's why you know another reason why we went down the route of sustainable performance management system because it's just a lot more flexible. Yeah, uh, doing that with a spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, I, I used to, you know, you know, I used to spend a lot of my time purely just doing that rather right. than getting out, talking to colleagues, helping them, doing what I could to ensure that the business was taking the right steps. You know, you've got to get that balance between doing and reporting. Yes. Um, so this just helps to, um, to to make that more effective. Okay, a more general question actually, but, a, but an interesting one. It's, it's a it's a it's a complex project uh, uh, that you've been on, and I guess this this question and the answer could apply to any, to, to any projects people are involved with. But yeah. uh, the question is, uh, how do you capture learning from projects? Me measures what work, what doesn't work, feedback effectively, and improve. So, as I say, it's a complex project you've been on. It happens to be a very important sustainable project, but, but what have you learned about projects in general from the process you've just been through? Uh, don't underestimate, um, don't underestimate, not so much barriers, but you think you've thought of everything. You know, we thought that we were very um, organized and prepared when it came to doing the tender. Yeah. Um, there were still a few things that we hadn't necessarily thought of. So, um, you know, really just to, to try and try and put things back into, you know, that kind of whole positive feedback loop, etc. To ensure that where there are learnings, that you do capture them, you do note them down, you revisit them. You know, we did a Nick and I did a sort of a proper sort of wash up conversation following the uh, presentation. Uh, you know, we're about to kick off sort of the next um, tranche of work with you guys, uh, with regards to you know what 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 do we want to do to try and the uh, the system for us to make it you know even better when it comes to data collection for. For, for this financial year, which you know is is fast approaching its end in in September, um, so I guess it's just you know having time to reflect um, and to note it down, revisit you know revisit what you're trying to achieve on a regular basis, uh, with a view to um, you know ensuring that you know if you've made any mistakes or if there have been challenges along, the way, you kind of you've noted them, you've documented them, and you you know you can kind of move on from them. Great. James, thank you again. I think we're running out of time, um, uh, people. So uh, thank you for all your questions. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and an especially big thank you to James. He's, uh, he's covered a lot of ground here today and uh, some of the questions he wasn't expecting, and he's answered them fantastically. What we will be doing is we'll be uh, posting uh, the recording of this to the Two Degrees uh, website and onto our blog. Uh, we haven't, as I said, um, answered all, all questions that have been asked. We'll try and look at some of the ones that maybe we've missed and, uh, and maybe get back specifically to the individuals who, uh, who asked them. So, um, again, thank you all for, for uh, joining today. Uh, thank you for your participation in terms of questions, and a big thank you again to James. Thank you very much. Thank you.